an enforcer in one of the toughest eras of rugby league. Few hit harder than Ian Roberts. 12 years, 194 NRL matches, he was a blue and a kangaroo. Ian Roberts' bravery on the park was matched only by his courage off it. Ian Roberts was rugby league's first openly gay man. Today, Ian works as an actor and has starred in more than 25 films. Tonight, Ian Roberts joins me one on one. Ian, thanks for coming in. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in ages, actually. So it's nice to catch up. Thank you, Stella. It was a very flattering introduction. <laughs> very, it gets worse, though. <laughs> Outstanding sportsman, loving son, proud gay man, working actor. In your mind, what defines you? Um, that's, that's a really tough question. I, I think we were speaking earlier, Stella, and I said I'm 51 this year and I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I think that kind of defines me a bit. Um, yeah. What about in the public's eyes? What do you think? Um, I would like to think that I, um, I have a good public profile, but you know, one of um, one in, in integrity, um, uh, which is uh, well. It's funny it's, it's talking about that now. I, I, I actually do want to get involved a bit more in, in conservation and that now too. So um, yeah, but I would I would hope to think that my um, my past kind of speaks for the type of person I am. I um, you know. <laughs> Uh, I am what I am, um, and I think, you know, that's enough. It's always enough. Uh, All right, it's impossible to talk about your great career without being in unison with your sexuality because I think they're very much intertwined. Very much. At, at what age were you certain that you were gay? Um, still, I've never known any different. I mean, I've never... Um, I've never... I can never remember feeling any, any, anything other than um, always uh, interested in, uh, in the same sex. OK. Um, yeah. By the early 20s, you debuted with South Sydney in 1986 uh, and in a short period of time, Jack Gibson had you as the best front rower in the game. Your coach, George Piggins, said you're the best ever South Juniors and the best player in the game. <laughs> what were your four years like at the Rabbitohs? Um, I was, look, I, I, I grew up in, in that in, as, as a South Junior, so um, uh, it was very intimidating coming into, coming into that side, you know, with the likes of Mario and Les Davis and, and, and Boyley and... and and the reputation they had, I, uh, I remember coming in, you know, as as like a twenty year old thinking I was never going to be able to cut it with these guys because they had a, like they, they did have a ferocious um, attitude, um, and that that was in their style of play as well. Um, but yeah, I think um, things seemed to fall into place. We had, Gus was our uh, I played with Gus in '86. You know, it was his last year, and Gus was wonderful for, for South. What he did. Um, was unparalleled. I mean, he, he really, I, I think when George came in, because it was George's first year of coaching there, George was, um, not that he was out of his depth, but I think even George would have said that uh, it was a little bit intimidating coming in as, a, as his first coaching gig was a, was a first grade team. Gus was fantastic. Gus steered that team around and that kind of set the, um, set the platform for the next three or four years. So why the change to Manly? Um, it was all about. I think it was all about money back then. Um, it was. It was a difference of about a hundred thousand dollars a year, um, and that's that's basically um, all it came down to. Um, it was. Uh, it was a tough. You know, it was because I was a South. That South. Um, that South ideology. You know, once you, <laughs> if you come from there, you stay there. But I, you know, I think I was just the first. One of the first in the in the modern era. Um, that chose the money over, uh, over over the club. At both clubs, you, off the field, you, you, you're leading a secret life. To, to what lengths did you go to protect that? You know, it's kind of... And I can honestly... I mean, this is the first time I've, I've actually been asked on camera about this. I can honestly say, I think when I first came to South, I was, um, I was never closeted. Uh, even growing up, and then when I mean, George approached me in the in the first year and told me, you know, he didn't want me, he didn't think it was a good idea that me going to those clubs um, on Oxford Street, and um, uh, he because he was worried about my welfare. I, um, it's not until I, I went to Manly in 1990. I mean, I was never how can I say this um, at South. I was never um, openly gay. But there was, there was all, it was always a worst kept secret. Yeah. I mean, it, it, my sexuality was a worst kept secret in rugby league. Yeah. But that's because I was I wasn't leading a, a cl like a closeted life outside of rugby league. I was uh, you know I had um, I had partners um, outside of the game that um, 
when I went to Manly, I kind of made a, um, a, dis a decision that I wasn't going to be um, in the closet. And everyone at Manly knew I was gay. You know, like Igor, the, you know, Igor. Jerry Randall, the, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 um, Igor, the, uh, the mascot. The, oh, um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the sea eagle. Uh, they used to call it Igor as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the guy in, who, um, who used to be in the suit, Shane Goodwin, was my partner. So everyone at Manly knew. And that's like, um, uh, when I came out in, in public in 94, it was no one, uh, it was to the surprise of no one. Right. You were always aggressive. Was that manufactured or natural? Uh, manufactured, I think. I mean, it, um, I will say I became much more um, openly aware of my situation um, when I was at Manly, more so than, than at South. Uh, because by that stage, there was a lot of... Um, there, was a lot of um, there was a lot of crowd um, obscenities and, and that type of thing. And um, it was... It's not that it was intimidating, it was almost infuriating. Um, it just kind of put, uh, like threw gasoline over, you know, mm. over the fire. I, um, but I did want to, I mean, I, there was a conscious decision in, in about 91 to, to step up my game and, and be much more physical and much more dominant uh, and much more aggressive. All right, 91, you, you mentioned that year. This hit on Mick Potter, who's the best bloke in the world. I want you to have a look at this and, and the reaction and tell me what this represents him. This is Potter coming in. He runs into a brick wall there. And then the reaction. What is that saying? Yeah. Um, Not what are you saying, what is that saying? Yeah, I, 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 I can honestly say, Pete, and I don't say this with any pride, I don't say it with any... Um, um, I, don't have to, I don't say it with any pride. It's just a matter of the fact. At that stage in my life and career, I was... There was a few other things happening off the field too is, um, that were really, really personal. And um, uh, at that stage on the field, I mean, I, it was that point, I don't know if anyone's ever been in a, in a super confident frame of mind when you play football that you can't be stopped. But it wouldn't have bothered me then if, you know, and I don't say this for any pride, but you know, if you'd killed someone on the field. And I, and I, and I mean that in all sincerity. I'm saying, yeah. yeah. Um, but there was a lot going on outside of my personal life then. Um, uh, there was a young, uh, young lad, um, Blake Standing, who was HIV positive, a little boy, and um, I was very close to Blake before he passed away. Uh, he got the uh, virus through a blood transfusion. And I just, at that time, he, the prejudice that that poor kid was going through, and I, it was, um, I felt a bit responsible because... Um, I was living this cl almost closeted life and he was almost being abused for um, what I should have been uh, taking a bit of responsibility for or standing up uh, for, um, for gay rights and that type of thing more. And I just think it kind of bore out in the way I played the game. I just, uh, Blake passed away about two years after that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it was a whole conundrum of, of situations. It wasn't just about rugby league. OK, so I'm assuming it applies to the Gary Jack situation where you, you got in, in an on-field brawl. And Very much. And, I, you know, I can say this on, on, on air now. I, I apologise to Gary, and I've spoken to Gary since that. You know, I, he bore the brunt of my frustration, um, and it was, it was totally unacceptable. You know, uh, we had a, a court matter that, was, that we settled, and I, I, and I just want to, like, put it out there to him. I spoke to Gary and to his wife and, he, and his family. I, that was, I'm truly sorry for that situation. That was totally, um, it was totally irresponsible and it was totally not acceptable, ever. While you've got this angst going on, and it's kind of an internal battle, it would almost seem, the paradox is at Manly, you, you're playing a grand final, you're then going, you're playing origin football, you're playing for your country. How satisfying were those on-field achievements? Yeah, it was wonderful, but at... Um once again, I, my personal, like my off-field personal life was um, very much more of a concern and more. It almost uh, drained um, uh, the satisfaction I had from from my own, my my style of play and the way I was playing at that point was, you know, it was probably the best football I played in my mm. life at that point. Um, yeah, it wasn't until I, you know, it, it sounds crazy. I went up to North Queensland after that, and not too much success. But I, because I was. Publicly, I was out, and uh, my partner uh, that, at 
at that point was Andrew. He came out there with me and we were totally out. I enjoyed my two years of rugby league up there incredibly. It was almost like uh, it was almost like the thing blossomed. It was fantastic just to, uh, to live that style of life and to be that person and to, and to, and to actually stand up and, and, and own the responsibility I thought I always should have taken years later. And um, renewed an association with an old mate in Graham Lowe as well. Which Very much, yeah, yeah. Um, so you mentioned in the mid-90s that you publicly declared your homosexuality. Why then? Um, once again, I'll come back to the story of, of, of young Blake, uh, um, but there was also another situation in my life. Uh, Aaron Light was a young friend of mine who was murdered and um, uh, he was someone I really cared about. Uh, I apologise, no, it still no, gets me a bit upset no, when I talk about it. Um, I was, uh, Aaron was murdered and I, um, uh, I was the, uh, the, the Crown's main witness. Um, there was a, a coroner's inquest that went on for like years and years and years. Um, I just remember feeling, um, when the police came to see me about Aaron, I just remember feeling incredibly uh, ashamed that I, I was more at, at at some point I'd been more concerned about my rugby league career and what people, what the general public would think of me, than uh, than stepping up and doing the right thing by that child. I mean, Aaron was only uh, 15 when he was murdered. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he stayed with me and my partner for uh, for about a year. Uh, I'd known Aaron since he was nine. Yeah. Um, uh, he was. Involved in a, in, um, he'd been involved in spotted and, and checked it at, at a pedophile's um, uh, uh, home. Um, yeah, that was all unbeknownst to me when I knew when I first met Aaron, and when he he ended up being a street kid, he came and stayed with us. Um, uh, we got him off the street, look after him, um, and he was back on the rails. It's not until he was, he was back going to school he'd. Um, it's not until the police came in and he'd been staying with us for about six or seven months at that point, back at school and all that, that the police came to see me and yeah. they wanted they had him to, um, he'd been... Uh, he was want, to give evidence. They wanted him to give yeah. evidence against uh, this man, yeah, yeah. It, um, and I just remember that moment of thinking, just thinking, oh, this is going to destroy me. And it was, this is what I live with now. And believe me, Pete, I don't ask for anyone's... Um, sympathy or regrets because I, I totally am comfortable with what happened now. I mean, I can totally get my head around it. But I, for me to, to go to that point and think about my career when that boy ended up being murdered, you know, left dead dead in the ditch, it, it kills me, it crushes me. What was the reaction to you coming out and, and staying what we, we, I guess we knew in the game was the case, but in, in the game and out of the game, what was the reaction? I think it was, I think it was, there was a lot of relief for other people, particularly put people close, um, uh, people close to me. And my parents, you know, my parents by that stage had stopped going to the games because of um, because of what was, uh, certain crowd, what was being said in the crowd and shouted at me on the field. It made my mum and dad very uncomfortable. Um, but I think it was. I think my parents never wanted me to come out either. But I think it was to their relief, and, and they understood then why I had to come out. It almost gave them um, gave them the right to be there and and and. and and, uh, and stand up for me. Um, yeah, it was almost like everyone but Manly knew I was gay. It was no, it was no issue. Um, it made things much easier for me personally. Was there much correspondence after that or did you become a confidant to people getting in touch with you who'd gone through similar experiences? Um... Yeah, very much so, Pete. It was wonderful. Um, yeah, the, the amount of letter, uh, letters and as you said, correspondence that I received was so overwhelming, so fantastic. I, um, I you know, had a book released. I'm actually writing, an, I'm in the process of writing another book now. The um, Finding Out, which was released in about 97, was, was a very, very timely book, but it was also, it, it didn't really get into the depths of, of, um, of how dark uh, the situation became for me uh, at times. How dark did it get? Emotionally at your worst, what... How bad? Um, you know, we, 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 we talk about mental, the, the, the mental health issue that most men don't speak up. Well, I was just another one of those, of those guys who didn't speak up about mental health. And the, the way um, psychologically it... Um, yeah, I wasn't good for a long time. Um, you know, I, have, I, I, I regularly see a therapist now. Um, and, uh, but I'm 
I'm good. Okay. Well, I'm good. Amazing. Yeah, I'm just want to put that I'm good. I mean, I, um, when you feel like you're um, unable to, uh, to deal or, or to handle what everyone's expecting of you, I, I, um, continuously, it, it becomes an incredible weight to, to move around in, in society with and, and trying to keep up that happy face. Oh. You, you mentioned North Queensland, a couple of years up there, injuries uh, took you into retirement. You went to NIDA to study Wonderful. acting. Why, why acting? The, and I can honestly say, I mean, with all my heart, the greatest three years of my life. Yeah? Yeah, it was... Um, when I went to NIDA, I was... I mean, and here's something I, I hadn't spoken about uh, until just recently. I, um, I was basically illiterate, Pete, till I, was, I went to NIDA. I mean, I... I, um, this is only the second time I spoke about it in public. I, I spoke about it just recently at... Um, I did some work for an for organisation called AIM. It's uh, an Australian Indigenous yep. mentoring um, program experience. It's, but I, I learned to read and write when, when I was 37 years old through NIDA, through um, phonetics. Um, it, was, it was the most... It was like the whole world had become... Colour, I, was, I was living the world in black and white and, and the whole world had become coloured. Um, that experience was such a, I mean, it, creatively it was fantastic for what I wanted to do as well. I mean, I, you know, I was always part of an ensemble group at school and all that, but when League and that took off for me, I kind of didn't move away from, from um, that, that creative side, that acting side. I just, I got um, suffocated in, in League. But NIDA opened, it was, I can't, it, words can't express me, but the way that changed me as a human being and just yeah. um, uh, the... The way it al I allowed myself just to to begin to play again. It sounds like a crazy thing, a 37-year-old man playing, no, but it's fantastic. Crazy. Since then, you've been to Hollywood and you've, you've applied your trade over there. Um, you've been in over 40 films and, and TV projects. Let me say, most of those films were, were low-budget films. Well, not this one. Not, uh, not this one. A, a couple of them were fantastic, yes. A couple yeah. of them were super, yeah. What's it like being alongside one of the truly great actors in the world in Kevin Spacey here in Superman? Mate, we... Um, it, he, you know, he was, pro he was, and still is one of my three or four greatest actors. To, to, to be, to get, when I found out I got that part, and my first my actual, um, the first take we had was I was in a, a, a dialogue with with Kevin, um, and, and I met him basically on action. Um, but through the <laughs> through through that um, through that scene, he. He mesmerised me because he, it, you would have thought he'd known me forever. Yeah. Um, he was, yeah, he's a genius. Two years ago, you were part of a study on concussions, the effect of concussions in football codes in Australia. What was the result? Um, I had brain damage. That's, um, I can say that now because, I mean, little, that, it, it's such, such a t taboo subject um, to talk about mental illness and um, the effects... Uh, that it has on you, but I mean, which are what? 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 What effects do well, you I, um, feel now? I had uh, there was there was two uh, situations in um, uh, it's about six six years ago was the first one now that, that I actually lost time. I um, uh, was driving the car, then I was at home, and I don't know that was uh, that that's happened to me twice. I started losing some lo losing. Um, uh, lines in uh, in plays I was doing that um, and that mightn't sound like much, but the, when um, it, it's a lot when when I was been, I'd been saying those lines every day for months and months and months, and then to l totally lose pages, um, I didn't think a lot of, of it until um, uh, I bumped into a friend who actually was a part of the study, and I just I mentioned to him off the cuff, and that's how I got involved. Okay. Uh, I had the tests, MRIs, and all those. So, yeah, I, I, I do have some, some partial brain damage. All right, well, the good news is that you've got a, a series coming out on the ABC, I believe, <laughs> called Soulmates. Can Soulmates. you tell us a little bit um, about that? It's not really my series. It's a, the, the guy, it's, um, it, was a, it was a bit of a web pheno uh, phenomena a, a couple of years ago. Uh, the ABC had their first um, series last year. It got picked up by um, the ABC for a second series as well as uh, some American, um, American syndication who... Uh, so we'll be playing over in the States. I'm playing Tutmos. That's me. That looks it, like you're back in your seagulls, do <laughs> It's, uh, I, you know, I, it's, I can't look at it because <laughs> I actually, the, it was the most uncomfortable, um, uh, that headpiece was, I can't tell you how uncomfortable that headpiece was. Um, 
Yeah, it's fantastic. Well, well, but like, just uh, I've been very lucky, Pete. I've been in my acting career. Um, I've played a full spectrum of, of characters. Let me tell you, from being completely immersed in a um, in a uniform or, or um, a costume to being literally bare butt naked, you know, well, um, for uh, for a couple of scenes. It's um, it's quite liberating, Pete. Mate, it's you know. great to see you. Um, it's impressive and inspirational as always. And mate, good luck with the career and, and everything in the future. It's wonderful. Really good to see you. Thank you very much, Pete. Thanks, and thanks for coming in.